Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the world. We thank Allah for his coming and we thank him for giving to us his true servant, his last apostle, our messenger, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet you again my beloved brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> to Brother Bay, Brother Silas Muhammad, Sister Muhammad, Sister Tanita Muhammad, to the followers of Brother Silas Muhammad, to those who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who also, I should say, follow Silas Muhammad, and those who are followers of the Messenger of Allah. I thank Brother Bay for this invitation extended to us a few weeks ago to come and talk to the Muslims of this area. I'm very honored to be here and very grateful to Allah for the chance to sit and listen to my brother and the spirit of my brother and the commitment of my brother to that which he believes and feels is the divine truth. I said to Brother Bay a few weeks ago that I would be happy to come and see the Muslims and let the Muslims See me. And as we practice under the teachings of the messenger to search every one, one hundred percent before admitting them into the temple. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was giving us a very profound lesson that not only should we search 100% before permitting anyone into the temple, but we must search ideas 100% before we admit them into the real temple, which is our minds. Stop everything at the gate post of the ear and search it out for the truth of it. If it is truth, accept it. If it is truth, follow it. If in doubt, hold fast to what you know is the truth until the doubt is removed. 
the messenger of Allah said that when it gets dark, brother, the righteous don't move in darkness. He said, you wait for the flash of lightning and it will light up things in an instant, then make a few steps and then stop. And when the light comes on again, you make a few steps. We live in a time of great, great, great confusion. And in this time of confusion, we just can't move confused. You have to stand and stop and study and ask Allah as it is written in his holy Quran to guide us on the right path. I listened very carefully to Brother Muhammad And much of what he said, I can agree with. But I did not come here tonight to argue with him. Nor did I come here tonight to try or attempt to sit him down with what I believe to be the truth. This time that we are living in is a time of the manifestation of defense. It's not a lightweight time, it's a very serious time and those of us who sincerely and seriously are committed to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have to search deeply within ourselves because this day and this time Almighty God is trying the hearts of men to bring out of us things that we didn't even know was in us both good and evil. not an easy time, but it's a time divinely prepared for a good, good end. Those of you that I know who were followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when he was among us, each one of us went through certain things in our personal life in the nation. We all had up and down. We all had ins and outs. And this Quran teaches us that we would be tried severely at least once a year. At least one. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the greatest and the wisest of them all, a man whom we can agree met with God, walked with God, talked with God, was infused with the mind, the will, and the spirit spirit of God, that man is unusual to us because we grew up in hell with no knowledge of self, no knowledge of anyone else. He's right. We grew up in the old world falling after the old man, Yaqub, grafted devil. One hundred percent right. Now, Elijah Muhammad was strange. 
And we who followed him, attempted to follow him, we were not wise to his ways because the ways of God are not the ways of man. It is written in the scriptures, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I am from above while you are from beneath. It is very difficult to understand a man who has met with God and comes to teach us that we are God and we are a member of the divine family of God and we have been taught all our lives in America that we are not only not God but not even human. And here's a man with the seemingly impossible task of bringing the God power that is buried within the nature of the black man up to the surface. And he's dealing with trifling, foolish people who fight him every step of the way. So Brother Bay had trials that were common to all of us, but he had unique trials that were only his own. Brother Silas Muhammad partook of common trials of the nation, but he had unique trials all his own. Brother Farrakhan shared common trials, but he had unique trials that were uniquely mine. But the trials were not meant to destroy us or harm us or hurt us. They were meant to purify things that were in us that had to come to the surface in order for us to see ourselves as we really are, then repent and come to the righteousness of God. Brother Silas Muhammad, I want to say this to you. Very frankly, I admire your work. I thank God for the good that I see you doing. I long to see clean-looking Muslims again. I long to see clean sisters again. After that beautiful image and picture that the messenger gave us was destroyed. I'm proud of the clean brothers and the clean sisters that I see. I cannot not Good? No. But brothers and sisters, when you talk about unity, we can't force unity now or then. The Holy Quran says, you are on the brink of a pit of fire, and Allah saved you from it, and He united your hearts, and you became brethren. We can't do it on our own. Allah has to do it, but He can't unite oil and water. He can't unite hypocrites and believers. He can't unite right and wrong. He can't unite light and darkness. He can't unite truth and falsehood. So all of this has to come to the surface, be made manifest, and a separation takes place. No, no, I don't need that. And I don't want that. I'm not trying to run no cheering section to out-cheer those who came with Brother Muhammad. That don't make it true because we cheer for it. I think my brother is serious. And I respect his serious commitment. 
and I hope that he will also respect mine. Because I too, brother Muhammad, have not come to play. I too, brother Muhammad, have come for war. I too, brother Muhammad, am in pain because my Lord's name has been trampled in the mud. And I too desire to lift up his name. As the scripture teaches, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. You have not been crushed to earth, but he has. You are new, Brother Muhammad, on this job. But your teacher and mine, your father and mine, for 44 years, worked in behalf of not just a few of us who knew him, but everything he did, every thought he had, was for every black man, woman, and child on the earth. We may not have seen the wisdom in what he did, neither did the Moses of the Holy Quran, who followed after the wise man. He didn't understand everything the wise man did, therefore there came a parting of the ways. We may not have understood everything the messenger did, and maybe we'll live a long time before we come to understand what that mighty man did while he walked among us. Every trial that came to you, Brother Bay, to you, Brother Muhammad, to me, and to each one of you who were a part of the Nation of Islam, some of you I remember seeing years ago, those trials were to manifest those who would be the laborers that Almighty God would use in this that is called the second term or the second dispensation or what Wallace Muhammad calls a second resurrection. But there can't be a second resurrection until and unless there's a second death. And he produced the second death which brings the necessity of a second resurrection. I, uh, did not come here tonight to represent myself. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me, he said, brother, you make my great commission known and I will represent you to the people. So if I start running through books to try to find where I think I am, I may be exercising vanity. And to tell you the truth, what I've been through in the last few years, I know what vanity can lead us to. Sometimes when you reach the top of the mountain, you forget what the valley is. And God can take you to the top of the mountain and he can drop you all the way down in the valley. But when he takes you to the top of the mountain, know that that's a trial to see how you act. And then he'll drop you down in the valley to see how you act. And if it pleases him, he'll bring you back again. Holy Quran teaches us, and they say that when we have become as dust, Will we be raised again? Allah said, that's easy for me. 
Allah says, He is the one who gives life, causes life to grow, then brings us back to the worst part of life where after knowing, we know nothing. And this is what condition the nation is under. Spiritually, we came into the greatest knowledge ever given to a people in the history of the world. And after knowing many, if not most, fell under deceit, and after knowing, acted like we knew nothing. But that is yet not for the destruction of the nation, that is for the purification and the final separation of the hypocrites from the true believers. In 1973, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, and I'm quoting him, maybe others of you heard him say it, he said, brother, I don't like to think about it, I don't like to talk about it. But the nation is going to take a dive for the second time. He said it's going to go all the way down to nothing. When he saw the pain come into my face, he said, but don't worry, brother. It will be rebuilt and it will never fall again. I didn't understand what he meant. I didn't say, well, dear apostle, how is it going to fall? You probably heard the messenger say that when Master Farad Muhammad was with him, he would just say, yes, sir. Sometimes Master Farad Muhammad would say things to him and he said he didn't know how to say nothing else but, yes, sir. And that's the way we were with the messenger. He would say things, and we didn't even have the, enough intelligence to come back and question him further. We would just say, yes, sir, and then go home and mull it over or think it over. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that the fall of the nation on the surface was due to corruption, but the fall of the nation was divinely written in order to produce the rise of the people out there. Let us see. How would the nation fall? As Brother Muhammad said, it would fall by deceit. But you can't be deceived unless there's something weak in you. And if we were deceived, then there's something inside that the deceit manifests in the one that is deceived. Just bear with me a few minutes. There is nothing that has happened in the nation, to the nation, that our messenger didn't see foresee and tell us about. The messenger of Allah said he was the last of the prophets. Because it's only the old world that needs prophets. Because prophets, he said, are the stars of God. They don't come when something is right. They come because something is wrong. They come like a sheriff flashing their badge under the authority of God. They come to arrest evil and the evil doers. 
prophet didn't come into the world or need to come into the world until evil came into the world. In the hereafter, you won't need prophets. Because prophets are raised to explain and to lift fallen humanity. But in the hereafter, if we are able to get through the fall of this world into the next, The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it would be perpetual prosperous. No more rise and fall, spiritual night and day. It will be continuous day, continuous progress in the hereafter. In the book of Genesis, The Genesis starts off telling us about a man whom God made. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did say that that man that God made, he was talking about Yaqub and a made devil. But there's also a spiritual counter-relationship or relationship to every physical thing that we read. Notice in the Genesis, God makes a man. He gives the man divine order. Don't eat of this tree in the middle of the garden. Eat from everything else. God makes the man, makes the woman from the rib of man, according to the book. Then he gives instructions. Now while he's giving instructions, the serpent evidently was right there listening, as the serpent is always listening. When God is giving instructions, because among the righteous, as Brother said, and he's absolutely correct, there has always been this weak germ that had to be manifest so we could see the turmoil that has been going on within the original nation ever since our deportation from moon. When the messenger taught us of a dissatisfied scientist, is that right? Now what was he telling us these things for? Why did he say operate on a nation? Because he said there was a seed in there that had to be removed in order for a perfect world to come into existence. He took the drama that has been going on in the black man gave it form and gave it power to give us an example of what would happen if evil gets the upper hand over righteousness. Now, brothers and sisters, just as Adam was given Eve as a help me, God goes, then Adam goes, then the serpent comes. Isn't that something? As long as God was present, as long as God was present, Adam stayed on his post. Eve was in check. Serpent present but couldn't come forward. But when God went and left Adam, Adam went and left Eve, then comes the serpent to say to Eve, in modern kind of slang words. Say, uh, girl. Eve, listen. Science says that Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. They call it apple. 
The messenger said when you eat apples from somebody, that means you ate their philosophy. You ate their ideology. You ate a teaching that we would command it to deny. And we are commanded to deny truth mixed with falsehood. The serpent made an interpretation of God's orders to Adam and to Eve. And after the serpent made that interpretation, Adam, I mean Eve, yielded. Adam comes back, he yields, and both of them find themselves with their eyes coming open and then dying. God's orders were, you eat that fruit, the day you eat it, you will surely die. The devil's suggestion was, no, you won't. Your eyes going to come open. God is really trying to keep you from seeing that you could become his equal. That's the suggestion. Now that same picture that you see in Genesis, God making a man. The man is alone. From the man comes a woman to help the man. Then the serpent comes after God is gone, after the man is gone, to deceive the woman. The scholars and scientists of religion say that whenever God sends a prophet, he's always a singular man, alone, by himself, with the help of God. The making of a woman from the rib, as the rib is that which protects the lung and is an encasement for the heart, and the lungs is that which takes in air, which is called inspiration. So a prophet from the inspiration of God and out of the love of truth speaks that truth and forms a community to help that prophet to meet the commitment of the will of God. And the duty of the community is to obey that prophet. The community is to obey Adam, or the woman was to obey the man. Now what are we getting at? It is the disobedience to God's divine law that brings the fall. But none of us would disobey God knowingly except the devil. So in order to get us to disobey God, it has to be camouflaged in deceitful language. All right. When God came back, they didn't even see him coming back. They just heard his feet, according to the Genesis, walking in the garden, and they begin to tremble. Now, how does that relate to us today? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in his person, in the wisdom that God brought him, was the seed of a new world. He was the genesis of a new world, for as God formed all things out of total darkness, so did he, Allah, form us out of triple darkness. That's right. And there was one man standing in America in 1934 when the nation fell for the first time. It was Elijah Muhammad who stood or who was stood up by Master Farad Muhammad in 1934. And Master Farad Muhammad said, Here 
Kareem. Here, Kareem. They had been making their choices up to that time, but Master Farad Muhammad said, if you, according to what the messenger told us, since you've made your choices, would you like for me to make one? And they said, yes, sir. She said, well, here, Kareem. He was sitting in the back, according to what we were taught. And Master Farad Muhammad called him up and said, here, him. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, when Master Farad Muhammad was getting ready to go, and when I say said to me, that don't mean he didn't say it to some of you. But I wasn't there when he spoke to some of you, but I know what he said to me. And if you heard it also, you can bear with me. He said that when Master Farad Muhammad was ready to go, he said, Brother, you don't need me anymore. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to him, Oh, yes, I do. He said, Oh, no, you don't. He said, Oh, yes, I do. And the Savior said, No, you don't. And he told me when Master Farad Muhammad left him, he looked out his window and the tears rolled down his cheek for his best friend whom he had been with night and day for three years and four months or so had left him and he was all alone with nobody because those that were taught of Master Farad Muhammad should have heard the man that Elijah Muhammad said they should hear. But after Master Farad Muhammad was gone, that's when all the trouble broke out. Hell broke loose. The messenger said he had a hypocrite in his family. His brother, Kala. Is that right? Many people said, look, why should we listen to him? We heard the prophet too. He was trying to bring them up into a better knowledge of Master Farad Muhammad. And they said he's trying to make something out of himself. And they began to plot against his life. Brother Muhammad, can nobody kill nobody whom God is with? And if you say you are a prophet of Allah, that's Allah's business with you. And nobody can set you down, but the God that you say you represent. Now, if you are false, then the God knows it, and the God will answer that. And if you are true, then God will manifest that truth, so there don't have to be no little cheap debate in no little room like this. Brother Muhammad, this is not the place where God answers in argument over words that I can see and you can see, but we perceive differently. We all can look at a mountain, but we see it differently. We all can look at a man and see him differently. We all can look at the Quran and see it differently because our experience, our upbringing, our, our development makes us see things differently. But when God got his hand on a man, at some point in time, all will be made to see and bear witness or die. This Bible, where you quote from, Brother Muhammad, uh, Deuteronomy 18 and 18 says that if a man prophesies in the name of God and he's not from God, it ain't for nobody else to sit him down. It's for God to sit him down because he's lying on God's name. 
That ain't got nothing to do with me because I have not said I was no prophet. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's all I want to be. But every one of us could claim it if we followed the messenger exactly as the messenger say we would have to say we were prophets like Moses. I can't condemn that, Brother Muhammad, because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the Moses. But all I can say is he's more than Moses. He's the whole book in my judgment because he said, According to the scripture, you look at the scripture and in them you think you have life, but they testify of me. For it is written in the 40th chapter of Psalms, and lo, I come in the volume of the book. The messenger said this to us many times. In his lecture, The Theology of Time, he said, I am a fulfiller. He said, the only reason you think that I've done things wrong is because you don't know what the last one is to look like. He said, the last one fulfills or touches the lives of every prophet that ever lived before him. Dear beloved brother Muhammad, you just started a few years ago. But Elijah Muhammad's life touched every one of the prophets. Not just Moses, he touched Abraham, he touched Noah, he touched Lot. Where did he touch them? Let's go after it. Let's go after it, my dear beloved brother. And I don't go after this in no spirit of ugliness. Because I love that man. And I love what he produced. And I love these brothers and the way they look and the way they believe. I'm not against this. I fight for this and preserve this with my life. I won't call you, brother, no hypocrite. I won't call you no false man. I never have said that. No, no, no. I have said to Brother Muhammad what I disagreed with him on. And my... That's all right. It did fall, but it's going to be lifted up again, and those that's going to lift him up are right in this room. (laughs) Beloved, I, I just beg you to reason with me. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's life is is so profound and so unique that he touched Abraham. He touched Noah. He touched Lot. Do you remember when Abraham Sarah was barren, couldn't produce a child for Abraham? Abraham went into his handmaiden, right? Or her handmaiden, Hagar. And Hagar gave Abraham his first child. All of a sudden, Sarah causes Abraham to put that wife and that child out in the wilderness. Now, if you were a contemporary of Abraham, you might be tempted to misjudge him and say, look at that evil, wicked man throwing his wife or his wife out of the house after she gave him that beautiful child. But in the wilderness, when that woman was running with that little baby, looking to the hills for help, yet under her foot, the scripture says, was a bubbling well. That was to teach the wives today of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that yes, you fulfilled that. You were running in the wilderness, but when he wasn't caring for you, there was a God that was looking after you and your babies until the time came right that you could come home. He touched that scripture. 
Abraham? Oh, yeah. Abraham was a friend of God. Never was there a friend of God more a friend than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Never was there a man more in the bosom of God than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. How can you prove it? Abraham never had what Elijah had to face. There wasn't no prophet of the past that ever faced what the messenger had because the messenger, the last one, was seen in the midst of four beasts. And you know what a beast does to a lamb. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't walk a day. He didn't walk a month. He didn't walk a year. He walked 44 years in the midst of vicious beasts and they shut their mouths at that man. He was in the bosom of God. Noah had some sons. And after Noah preached 120 years, one son, well, the Bible says a little different than the Holy Quran. The Bible says that family got in the ark. And after the ark landed, Sometime later, they said Noah got drunk. After the Noah was naked, under what the Bible calls drunkenness, he had three sons. One of them mocked the father's nakedness, according to the Bible. Two of the sons wouldn't look on their father's nakedness, but refused and covered him over. And Noah cursed that son that was an ungrateful son. After the father got his nasty self out of the flood, he turns and mocks his father's condition. The father's condition left itself out of the flood. He turns and mocks his father's condition. The father's condition wasn't a trial for the father. The father's condition was a trial for his son. Because there was something hiding in the heart of that son that had to be made manifest. And only those kind of conditions could bring out of that ungrateful, wretched heart what lay hidden there. But we move on through. Dear beloved brothers and sisters, the Holy Quran says Noah had a son and that son, hear me, beloved brothers and sisters, that son didn't believe in his father. When the father gave the command to get into the ark, the son said, no, I will betake myself to the mountain. Noah went out and pleaded to God for the life of his son because, like any father, he loved his child. But what was God's answer according to the Holy Quran? He said, look, I know best who your son is. If you plead for him one more time, I'll drown you along with the rest of the unjust. He's not your son. He is the very embodiment of evil. That's the Holy Quran balance with the Bible. The messenger touched the life of Musa in the cave and he touched the life of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah because the messenger had hypocrites among the wives. Didn't he? Those of you who know, you know. And those of you who don't know, you come into the knowledge of it. But he touched the life of Noah. He touched the life of Lot. He touched the life of Abraham. He touched the life of Musa. 
Because Moses went up into the caves and hillsides of Europe to lift up a serpent. And the Bible says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. You need civilizing. And that's why in the lessons it says, why did Musa have a hard time to civilize the devil 2000 B.C.? But the question is not, why did Musa have a hard time civilizing the devil? The question is, why did God ask why? Because he knew that Elijah Muhammad would have a hell of a time trying to civilize you and me, while at the same time battling the most wicked, vicious enemy, that even the prophetic, symbolic picture of Pharaoh don't do no damn justice to. Pharaoh and Egypt don't do no justice to what the real Moses went through. I agree with you, brother. That picture of Moses don't show Pharaoh's sagacity. That picture of Moses don't show a man using mind-controlled drugs. That picture of Pharaoh don't show him so cunning he can suggest into your subconscious mind things that you don't even know are there and make you an enemy of your own self and an enemy of your own people. That, that biblical picture don't show that. It gives you a hint of it. So the messenger fulfilled Musa and he fulfilled the Moses. Brothers and sisters, I know it's late. And I, I really don't like to hold you so long. And but I will come to where I'm going if you just bear with me in a few minutes. Beloved brothers, sisters, if you trace the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's life and study the lives of the prophets in that man's 44 years, he fulfilled it all. Brothers and sisters, as the Old Testament closes, it says, end of the prophet. And it closes saying, Elijah will come. The New Testament is not prophecy. Because if you study the New Testament all the way through, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans by Paul, and John the Revelator, most of them keep repeating the prophecies of the Old Testament. So the New Testament is a testament of fulfillment that starts with a virgin giving birth to a child. I agree with you, Brother Muhammad that in one sense uh, he is like Mary that's true too but dear beloved brother we can't just look at prophecy from one side prophecy has many angles to it and I don't know whether you heard the messenger say this but he said, when you look at my word, look at it from above it, from beneath it, from this side, from that side, because you can't take my word surface. There's depth as there's depth to God. there got to be depth in God's word. And if you don't go deep enough, you'll be a superficial surface help. And lo, I come in the volume of the book brother muhammad the messenger did say that he was the jesus 
He did say that. I didn't come here tonight with all of the ammunition and because I didn't know that uh, I would be having to prove this tonight. Brother Bay didn't tell me this. When I talked to Brother Bay, honest to God, brother, I said, no, sir. I don't want to be a part of no beauty contest that we come forth and strip down and show our wares and let the people make a choice. I tell you, brother, the people ain't watching. Hell no. God is independent. He don't need none of these. He put his word out that it take it or let it alone. We ain't got to prove a damn thing, either here or no place else. If you fuck God, stand on God. If you ain't for God, get the hell out of the way. God is the final judge. I told this brother on the telephone that I didn't want no kind of thing like this with Brother Muhammad. And I wouldn't be a party to that. Do you know why? Because a devil don't like what Silas Muhammad is doing. And the devil don't like what Brother Farrakhan is trying to do. I know that. And I don't want no slick crack in the between us trying to force us to clash with each other while these little spectators get a front row seat to see what? Hell no. I could walk out of here right now and say to hell with it. That don't prove that I'm wrong and it don't prove that you're right. The proof of right and wrong is out there in the field. There's a big field awaiting the wide awake man to work out in. Try out your rod in the field. That's where God will be manifest. Not in our lack of understanding or misinterpretation of divine words. And Brother Bay would tell you, if he's a truthful man, that I told him that. I said, well, brother, if Brother Muhammad Abdullah and Brother um, Silas Muhammad and whoever else is coming on Friday, I said, I, I won't be there on Friday. I said, I just came to talk to the Muslims, to let the Muslims search Brother Farrakhan and question me. That's all I came for, because I'm your brother. And I don't love one of the messenger's followers. I love them all. And I'm not trying to be no big shot, brother. I ain't never been no seeker after fame, but I have a weakness. And God exposed the weakness in my fall, just like you have a weakness. And God exposed yours in your fall, yes. So what if you woke up first, brother? Hell, there were many that woke up and saw Master Farad Muhammad before Elijah. That don't mean anything. God is the answer of it all. He knows the planting. He knows the reaping. He called you forth, brother, and he called me forth. You didn't call me. You did not call me, brother Muhammad. When you were in Chicago, I was in Los Angeles talking with your wife, and she's the first one that told me you had gone to Chicago. I applauded your courage. But, Brother Muhammad, you don't know what I was doing behind the door because you and I never talked. I'm not saying this to be smart. I'm saying it out of love and concern because we should never let the devil come between us for no damn petty vanity. No. When he first wrote this letter to Wallace Muhammad, we met in Hollywood. I said, brother, I agree with 99% of what you wrote. And I wasn't lying to him. I said, brother, if you want to be successful, don't say you're the prophet like Moses because the believers, they only know the messenger as the messenger of Allah and you won't get them up off the ground. That was my advice. But Brother Muhammad 
feels this deeply and he has every right to go before the world if he believes this. Nobody got no right to stop him and we will stop anybody that try to stop him. But I don't know nobody but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm not following nobody but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I want to be a prophet like Moses too, but I don't want to call myself a prophet because the day of prophets is gone. This is the day of God. Prophets represent God in the absence of God. God is present. You bear witness he's present. We are done with prophets. We've come now to the time of God. You are God. God do this kind of work, raising men from the dead, but you're not doing it on your own, Brother Muhammad. You're doing it on the word of Elijah Muhammad. Your prophecy, the end of the prophets came when the last book came, and that's the Quran. And until a new book comes, you've got to call yourself an apostle or a messenger. But the messenger was gentle with us. He said he was a messenger, but he's actually the reflection of God. But we weren't able to see that. The virgin could mean the messenger. He was like a woman to Master Farad Muhammad. He told me how Master Farad Muhammad wooed him just like a man wooed a woman. That's what he said to me. He said, brother, they would be out in the Chevrolet and it would be cold. And he would say, are you cold? And he would pull the messenger closer to him till the messenger fell so much in love with Master Farad Muhammad. He wanted to talk like him, walk like him, be like him. And that's the way a man is supposed to have his wife like that. So when he put the truth in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, brain like a man put the sperm in the womb, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad could only bring forth children that look like God. You are the son of God. And I am a son of God, but I'm a filthy son that needs to be purified. That's all. No, I'm not coming to you out of no holy bag. I'm not coming to you saying I don't have no fault. I'm not coming to you saying that I have not sinned. No, I have. But I pray to Allah to forgive me for what I did against myself and against the Lord who taught me what I know. I'm coming to that in one minute. Some of you brothers, the messenger, the black man is a virgin. The black nation is like a woman. The messenger in the history of Jesus said, Mary <laughs> and Joseph were childhood sweethearts. He said, and at the age of six, they were engaged to be married. Is this not his teaching in the history of Jesus? He said, when Joseph came unto Mary under that cover of darkness with the goat's beard that Mary was supposed to wear. Joseph wore it. Is that right? He said this was a sign of Master Farad Muhammad coming in the clothes and flesh of a devil to get up next to the black man to start impregnating with the truth, with a messenger. And the black nation in America produced a messenger. And that messenger was a little Jesus that grew up. And he, Elijah, opened your eyes and mine. And every one of you whose eyes are open under the power of Brother Silas Muhammad's righteousness and truth, it is Elijah's power on him, or Moses' power on him that opened your eyes. And if I raise a dead man and clean the brothers up by the power of God, it ain't me working, it's Elijah working in you and me who believe in that man. 
Oh, brothers and sisters, can't you see that the messenger worked among us like Jesus was among the people? Oh, brothers, sisters, the man raised Lazarus from the dead. The messenger's fame spread around the world because he got junkies and wine heads and thieves and pimps and prostitutes to clean up. That's how the world got to know Elijah Muhammad. That's how they got to know Jesus. And when Jesus, I, I got plenty, just need a little water. When Jesus, are you listening? I know it's long, I know. See, but I have to come back to you, Brother Babe, because if you had done it like we had agreed in the beginning, we wouldn't be here at 12 o'clock. But you see, brother, this is the day of our manifestation too, yours as well as mine. See, if you made an agreement with me, Brother Bay, and your word is your bond, I'm not going to tell you how to run your show, but we agreed that I would come tonight and talk to the believers and the Muslims alone. Yes, we did, brother. Yes, we did. Today at the airport, brother says, well, brother minister, I mean, Brother Silas Muhammad is going to speak. This is the first time I know about it. Now, if we thought we were coming here for a big debate, I'd have had my briefcase loaded too. But hell, you tell a man, load up your gun and tell me to come to a tea party, and then when I get there, the trap is sprung. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me they would dig ditches for me, but I wouldn't fall in it. And I'm not falling in no ditch that nobody did, you or anybody else in here. I'm independent of everything but Allah and his messenger. And I ain't bowing or begging a damn soul to walk behind me. I don't need nobody to walk behind me. I want us to walk behind the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and rebuild the house that a devil and hypocrite have torn down. And if that's what you want and that's what I want, we can't be no damn sidewinders, shaky fellas. No, you got to purify too, brother, just like me and all of us. And we got to come straight, and we got to come clean, and we got to come right. See, a Muslim can be a real treacherous thing when we start deviating. We are the most wicked when we go astray. Because we can become deceitful with a smile and hypocritical with a smile and low down and rotten with a smile but don't mean nothing that we say. If I hadn't showed up here tonight, what would the result be? Would I read in the, the Messenger magazine, Farrakhan renege on a debate with Silas Muhammad? Would I read that I back down from Silas Muhammad? That's my brother. I ain't backing down from him, but I'm not fighting him. We got a bigger enemy on our damn back than one another. What is this set up for? What is behind the mind that set it up? We want to know where everything is at. If you read Message to the Black Man, you heard the messenger? You know where everything is at. You ain't following Parkon. You following Elijah Muhammad. We ain't here for no damn personality thing. Sure, Farrakhan can talk, but talking ain't living. Talking ain't anything but a word. But what we gonna do with the word? That man was following the messenger. A soldier like there never was one. Yes, I'm not gonna take nothing from my brother. He made FOI like we've never seen FOI before, just like he's making you now. And I'm proud of that work, as I was proud of it then. Brother, I'm not in you. I'm, I have to tell you, that ain't in my heart. God didn't make me like that. He made me pleased with how he made me, and he made me pleased with how he made you. Because it's not going to take me nor you but us to get it done.
I'm going to say this, brother, I love you all, but I think that we ought to do things according to our word and clean it up. I agree with brother Silas Muhammad. There was a lot of people sneaking in hotels, sneaking out. There was a lot of people stealing. There was a lot of people shucking. There was a lot of people jiving. You know, brother, when you ain't never been on that track, you don't know what the hell that track looked like till you start going down that road. Anybody can say what they are, what they think they are, till they've been tested. I'm telling you, brother, you don't know what it's like to stand up over people, not people like us. Ain't none of us perfect, but man, you handled $100,000 before? When you sell the messenger magazine, do you bring the money, you turn it in? Or do you pay a bill and, and tell the brother, well, I, I'll be back with it later? See, if you're not faithful over little things, you won't ever be made ruler over many things. Brother, the messenger's whole 40 years among us was a preparatory thing to bring about the proper labor and staff. For the harvest is right, but the labor is Ain't nothing but a few. The messenger was betrayed by a Judas. Brother Muhammad, you haven't developed to that stage yet that you could be betrayed. And if some one of these betray you, it's young yet. But at the height of Jesus' power, at the height of his glory, Judas betrayed his master. In the book of John, John talks about Judas and he says, speaking the words of Jesus, did not I choose you twelve and one of you is a devil? You mean could a devil be one of Jesus' disciples? Yes, there's a devil that did follow the messenger. Several of them. You give your heart over to Satan, he'll twist you up and make you something you never thought you was. What was Malcolm? Poor Malcolm. Poor Malcolm. Malcolm didn't know what was in him, but the wise purposes of God began to sift him until it brought it to the surface. Malcolm wanted to be loved by the people, and the devil sifted him. And I walked right there with him, brothers and sisters. He began to think that the messenger was jealous of him. The messenger ain't got no reason to be jealous of no little two-bit student that he made. Because the boy could talk, the boy couldn't think. And he proved that after he left the messenger. But the messenger sifted him too. And the messenger knew that Malcolm wouldn't last but ten years. And he whispered it in certain circles. After Malcolm defected, how did Malcolm betray his teacher? Malcolm started going on the radio, taking truth and giving it a wicked interpretation. And God snuffed out his life, but left him as an example. Brother, that was the act of a devil. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't do nothing but good for Malcolm. But Malcolm turned on his master. You got about ten more minutes, please.
in my last conversation with Malcolm, he said, Brother, my enemies one day will be yours. And he said, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about either. But when Malcolm started blaspheming the messenger, he said, Brother Farrakhan, or Brother Lewis as he called me then, what do you think about it? I said, I think there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. I said, uh, I got to go. I lived in Boston then. Malcolm put me in his car and was driving me to LaGuardia Airport. He said, Brother Lewis, don't tell nobody what I told you. I said, no, sir. I'm not going to tell nobody but the messenger. And I seen him jump. The next morning, 5 o'clock, Malcolm called me and said, Brother, give me a little time before you tell the messenger so I can write the messenger a letter and explain to him why I did what I did. I said, Well, brother, I said, It's going to take me some time to get my head together just to write the messenger what you told me. I said, You can get your letter off in the meantime, you help yourself. I couldn't sleep. I thought I was going crazy. I went to my study and I opened up this book as Allah is my judge to the 33rd chapter of the Holy Quran that talks about the wives of the messenger. And I ran back to New York, spent my last $30 and said, here it is, Malcolm. He said, I know it. He knew the truth. But he had grown to hate his master. And that's why he couldn't tell the truth properly because his heart was too full of hate. He's gone. And I stood up and became the spokesman of the man you call Moses. Wallace never was his spokesman. I was his mouthpiece. You can't deny that. I spoke for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I made 350 broadcasts. Every one of them approved by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So if you listen to any broadcast that I made where I said Elijah Muhammad was the Jesus, he approved it and sent it out. There wasn't one broadcast that came forth that Farrakhan spoke on that Elijah Muhammad did not hear first. Maybe a few that he let um, Valor and Najib hear, I think. And uh, I think there was a very few. But let's leave that alone. But the real Judas is coming up. Now notice how Judas stopped. Mary and Martha, these over women again. Mary and Martha got some ointment and they are rubbing and anointing Jesus' feet. And as they're anointing Jesus' feet, Judas is looking on. Now evidently, those women doing that for Jesus struck something in his heart. And that's the same thing that happened with the son of David, Absalom. He saw David's wife and wanted David's wife. That has both a physical and a spiritual meaning, brothers and sisters. Because Wallace, has cohabited with the spiritual wives of the messenger who were his ministers. And it's written in the book, 200 men of renown followed after Korah. And when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad left us, he had spiritual meaning, brothers and sisters. Because Wallace has cohabited with the spiritual wives of the messenger who were his ministers. And it's written in the book, 200 men of renown 
followed after Korah. And when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad left us, he had 200 temples and 200 ministers, and practically everyone went right behind Walter. Why did they do that? Why did you do it, Farrakhan? Was it because you was a punk? I want to let you know, brother, and all of you in here, this ain't no punk talking. If all of these brothers got the hell out of here and went back to where they came from, I tell it just like I see it and die on it and kill on it. Because Muhammad didn't make me no faggot. And I didn't shut my mouth February 26, 1975 because I was afraid. You don't know the inside of me until you ask me or ask God. And I know if you tell me that God revealed to you that I was afraid, I'll tell you, bring your God and I'll kick his butt. Because he'd be a damn liar. There wasn't no fear in me. Just like some child nigga came to my house the other day and told me what his God revealed to him that Farrakhan was dipping in the treasure. I said, go bring your God and I'll snatch his so-and-so tongue right out of his mouth and yours along with him. I ain't never taken as much as a dime or as little as a penny from the nation. And I'll die on that and I'll kill on that. I've been lied on, I've been slandered, I've been evil spoken of. That's why I came to see you. So you could see the man that you've been hearing all this crap about and look at me, listen to me, feel me, question me if you want me. No, you don't know me. And I think if you don't know me, then let's get acquainted. Let's get acquainted. Brother and sister, when I started rising and becoming popular, now remember no man can see himself. He needs his brother as a mirror to help him see himself. I don't know how I look to you all. I thought I was fairly humble, but I kind of found out later that I was a little arrogant. That's kind of proud, and, and I love God, but I kind of sort of love some of the world, too. Allah knew that, and the messenger knew all of that, because he could see into men and women. And nobody come and sit at his table to fool him. He just maneuvered you in such a way that you didn't even know you were being maneuvered, till you just showed your total self. Oh, brother, the man was and is a master, and he masters us right now from wherever he is. If he's in the grave, he's a master. If he's in heaven with Allah, he's a master. Wherever he is, he's the master of what's going on right now. He told me once about Elisha, when they put Elisha down in the grave, and said the bones of a dead man shook in the grave. He said, do you know what that means, Brother Farrakhan? I said, no, sir, dear Papa. He said, that means that Elijah ruled from beyond the grave. He said he was so great, he reached out from beyond the grave to guide the destiny of men. Brothers and sisters, as I began to get popular, the word was whispered about, a hypocrite is going to rise up. That's going to make Malcolm's work looked like the work of a little child. How many of you heard that? Raise your hand. All right. And how many of you who heard it had your eyes on me as that chief hypocrite? Yeah, you did. Maybe you ain't got courage enough to raise your hand, but I'll raise my hand, your hand for you. I mean, it was a hell of a thing for me to come to San Francisco and know that in the Bay Area, I was being called secretly a hypocrite. I'm preaching the messenger with all my heart. And brothers, you know who that next hypocrite's going to be? 
in a fire coming, man. Watch fire coming. And God had you watching me so the real one could come up and slip in. Like the scripture said, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed wheat in a field. And while men slept, an enemy crept in and sowed tares in among the wheat. Say, well, how could Farrakhan fall with all that he know? All that he know? That man should have been wise enough to see this. That's what you say. But I want you to go back and pick your words out of your brain and go back beyond Farrakhan. That's just a little fella. I ain't nothing but a few day old baby. But what about the God? The God who had all of the knowledge who fell asleep and allowed a devil to rule. You're going to go back and attack them for what's written? No, no, no. You're not going to use Farrakhan as no cover for your own damn hypocrisy. You're not going to throw no stones at me to hide your own crap. None of you. I'll take mine, but damn it, you take yours. Now, brother and sister, I'll tell you why I never fought Wallace D. Muhammad publicly. And you can check it. I put my life on what I say. If you find me lying, just kill me. That's all. I'm just as bold in what I'm saying as brother is in what he's saying. I die on it. Now, Brother Muhammad, I'll say this. See, I ain't, I didn't get no authority behind no closed door. I got my authority to do what I'm doing directly from the mouth of the messenger of Allah in the view of thousands of people. I know what he said to me privately, which you don't know. And if you don't believe, it's immaterial to me. Because if God is with me, can't nobody do nothing with me. And if God ain't with me, if all of you came with me, you'd be making a terrible mistake. So popularity ain't got nothing to do with this. It's what God and the messenger had in mind. Now, many of these ministers, during the height of all of this talk of hypocrisy that this new hypocrite was going to rise, the theology of time came. And the messenger, I was sitting in the back of the ministers, and the messenger called me out and sat me down in, in the front row. He said, I want you down front, brother, where I can keep my eyes on you. It could mean evil, it could mean good. Depending on how you look at me and how you look at the messenger and what you got in your own heart. When I sat down on the front row, the messenger looked at me and said, <laughs> and told me to sit down in his seat in Chicago. I was so scared, I didn't know what to do. The next week I came back, Rasul made sure I had a seat on the front row. Then the messenger said, where's my minister? I hear him. Come on out here, brother. I stood up, I said, yes, sir, the apostle. He said, no, come right on out here. I stood right by his side, and these are his words. He said, when you see this brother, look at him. When he speaks, listen to him. And whatever he tells you to do, do it. And whatever he forbids you to do, don't do it. He said, for this brother will get you across the river. Yes. 
And when he gets you safely to the other side, he's not going to say, look what I have done. He's going to say, look what Allah has done. Now, believe me, brother and sister, I was tore up. I don't know what the messenger was talking about. I went on back and faded into oblivion. 1975 comes up. No, 74. You got to hear it. So you know, because I might not be coming back this way no more either. But I'll tell you something. Something is coming behind us. Because I'm not before you or you of myself. I didn't come back from the grave on my own power. So what was you doing in the grave in the first place? Give me five more minutes. Think you want to know why I didn't stand up? Brothers and sisters, Nineteen seventy four Wallace comes back in. Is that right? Wallace left his father in sixty four. Wallace left his father came back in sixty five and repented. Wallace left his father in sixty seven. And in his own Bilalian news he said when he made his pilgrimage to Mecca. He said that he would oppose anybody, even members of his family, if they didn't follow the way of Prophet Muhammad. These are his words. In 1967, he told his father straight to his face, I ain't never believed in that man, Master Farad Muhammad, that he was God. He came back in 70, I think 70, and left in 71. And when he heard the messenger was getting sick, he slipped in. Now remember, them women that was anointing Jesus' feet, this old slick Judas hypocrite hid his hypocrisy behind a firm resolution. heavy statement because if you follow Wallace's whole teaching I don't know brother about him being your brother I wouldn't want nothing like that as my brother he's a devil and if he submit that between him and God but Noah's son was killed Absalom was killed. Judas went out and hung himself. And every day that Wallace opens up his mouth, he's hanging himself. Now, brother, he started hanging himself when he got in his heart the sick idea that he was greater than his own father. That's the words of Iblis in the Holy Quran. I am better than you. And the Holy Quran says, when the devil said, respite me till the day when they are raised. And Allah said, surely thou art of the respited ones. And the devil said, I'll come at them from before them, from behind them, from the left side and from the right side. And you're not going to find most of them thankful. I will make all of them deviate. And Allah said, whosoever follows you, I will certainly fill hell with you all. And just like Allah makes everything according to this Holy Quran in pairs, there's a physical manifestation of that Judas and there's a spiritual manifestation of that Judas. There's a physical manifestation of that Korah and there's a spiritual manifestation of that Korah. For wealth is not only money, wealth is wisdom, wealth is fame, wealth is reputation. All of that is considered wealth. 
Now, brothers, sisters, when Wallace came in, he said from his mouth later that every time he came back, Raymond Sharif would question him. But this time when he came back, his father wouldn't let Raymond Sharif question him. Now we got to ask, why? Why did he let When Wallace came in, he said from his mouth later that every time he came back, Raymond Sharif would question him. But this time when he came back, his father wouldn't let Raymond Sharif question him. Now we got to ask, why? Why did he let him back? Why did he put him in the ministry? Why did he give him the exalted position over temple number two? Why? It was time that the scripture had to be fulfilled. The master was about to be betrayed. You can't betray him until false witnesses arrive. You can't betray him until the true witnesses are silent. And then when the true witness is silent, then the false witness sway the court. And the court said, crucify him and took a thief in the place of the Jesus. And I'm telling you, Wallace is a thief. He stole the house. He stole the effect of the people of his father for himself. He stole a thief that wasn't ordained for him, but he can't remain in it too much longer because time is up. Yeah, he's a liar and a thief and a murderer. How is he a murderer? He killed the spirit of life in the people whom God's messenger had raised to life. He's full of envy and jealousy and hatred of his own father. If he was greater than his father, why the hell did he go out and build up his own temple? Why did he have to come in surreptitiously? Come right on in. He came in like a sneak thief. You know what I'm saying is right. Well, why did you fall for it, brother? You don't know this, maybe. But when Wallace came back and his father was in Mexico, sick. Wallace started moving about the country, solidifying. I know, son, I'm here long. Son, everything going to be all right, little, little brother. I know you can't understand what we're doing, but what we're doing is so important for the future of the whole nation. Because if the brothers in this room come together, the nation will be built. And if the brothers in this room don't come together, the nation's still going to be built. That's right. But so ain't nothing going to stop the words of Allah. Now, old Judas kept waiting for the opportunity. I got FBI files from the Freedom of Information Act. Brothers and sisters, I wish you could read what was going on in our nation that you attribute to good, clean, sincere Muslims. Most of the Muslims were not liars and thieves and cutthroats. These brothers and sisters believed in the messenger and they tried to live that life. Yeah, there was a few slipping and a few dipping, but they were not the rule. They were the exception. Because the messenger put the fear of God in his followers. It's going to come out that the FBI agents and even Russia had KGB. Agents of the Russian government, secret police, 
in the nation of Islam. Right up around the messenger were hypocrites and agents of the devil, and the messenger knew it and wrote on it in 1971 saying, how can we make progress with hypocrites on the panel? He had to devise a, 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 a trial that would separate the hypocrites. All right, I'm just about finished. Wallace came to New York City, came to the FOI, showed up one Saturday morning, unannounced, came in Friday night and talked to Captain Yusuf Shah and my secretary, ain't told me nothing but they had their plan working. The next morning they called me and said, Brother Minister, Minister Wallace Muhammad is here and he'd like your permission to address the fruit. I said, permission? Of course he can, but let me come down and introduce him. I ran down and was so glad to see him because everybody that loved the messenger loved Wallace D. Muhammad. All of us loved him. And I introduced that man in his own taste. I said, this is the one that the messenger wanted to help him in this work. And when I brought him forth, he said, you and me don't have no problems. I didn't know what he meant. But then he started talking, real independent life. And then he said, Master Farad Muhammad was more a savior of white people than he was black people. And the antennas went up. Then he turned around at me and said, Brother Farrakhan can keep his post as the national representative if he obeys the law. But if he break the law, I'll sit him down. And if 10 million of you don't like it, you just have to get used to it. I didn't know where all that was coming from. In the back room, we talked. Wallace moved to Los Angeles, got all the laborers here. He moved into Atlanta, got all the laborers there. Finally, the messenger is back in Chicago, in the hospital, looks like he's getting better. Then he takes a turn, quote unquote, for the worse. And the stuff is flying. They keep asking me, come to Chicago, see the messenger. I had a little cold, but I use it as an excuse. I said, no, I don't want to see the messenger because I got a cold. And I don't want any germs for me to make him any worse. But in my heart, I knew that was my reason. My reason was, I felt they were calling me there to swear allegiance to Wallace, and I wasn't swearing no allegiance to nobody, not as long as my messenger was here. Finally, I wouldn't go on February the 25th. Now, February the 23rd, it comes out in the headlines of the Chicago Defender, Wallace D. Muhammad, to uh, head the nation if anything happened to uh, messenger or Muhammad. Valora Najib called me and said, do you know what that man did? He put it in the paper. I don't know what's raging out there in Chicago. I'm in New York. February the 25th, I get a call from my son who was standing guard outside the messenger's room. My son said, Daddy, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad just passed. I said, son, are you sure? He said, yes, sir, daddy. I didn't know what to do. I don't know how you felt, but I was lost. Because the messenger didn't tell me he was going to die. He said, I'm going away for three years. He said, I'm going away to study, brother. He said, now don't you change the teaching while I'm gone. I'm telling you just what he said, and I don't care if you don't believe me. It don't make me no difference, because Allah is sufficient as a witness, and I don't play with Allah. Brother, he said to me, now, nah, brother, 
He said, what I've given you is just a wake-up message. He said, but if you are faithful, when I return, when I return, he said, I will reveal the new teaching through you. I'm telling you just his words to me. Now, brother, when they tell me that he's dead, you figure out what happened in my mind. He said he was going for three years, he's coming back. Well, what does that mean? If he's dead, if he's gone, what can I do? I got confused. And I said, well, man, I can't. Even though he told me that I could sit in the chair as a father over the house in his absence, he said that too. But I can't lie to you. I can't play no games with your life. This ain't about a game. And if I didn't think I knew what the next step was, I couldn't sit in the seat. So on February the 25th, I got on a plane and went to Chicago, called Elijah Muhammad Jr. and told him I was in town, then looked at the TV, and on the TV was Jeremiah Shabazz, Abbas Rasul, and Kareem Hassan saying that Wallace Muhammad is the new leader and Jeremiah Shabazz was the new national representative. I had been wiped out just like that. I'm looking at this. You know why I was wiped out like that, brother? Because they knew what the messenger had said. But do you think they'd let any non-family member sit over the wealth of the nation? Brother Muhammad, as God is my witness and my gift, I ain't never stole a dime or as much as a penny. And if anybody can prove that, I'll give you my life. But if you slander me one of these days, I'm coming after you, brother. And if I'm worthy of death for what you charge me with, what are you worthy of if you lie on me? The next morning, February the 26th, I meet with Wallace D. Muhammad in the office. Tears in my eyes, I said, brother, I came to offer you my help in the awesome responsibility that you have undertaken. Hear me now. I said, but brother, when you were in New York, you said something about Master Farad Muhammad that I would like you to clear up for me at your earliest convenience, but today the devils will be watching and they'll use anything we say to foment division among the Muslims. And I said to him, I will say nothing or do nothing to contribute to no disunity. He looked across the messenger's desk and said, brother, I need your help. Sharif, he came out from behind the desk. Sharif stood between him and me, had one hand on his shoulder, one hand on mine, and said to me and him, Brother, from this day forward, if you have anything to say to each other, don't say it in the public. Say it to each other. We agreed. That's the morning of February 26th. afternoon of Savior's Day, Sultan Muhammad comes to me and says, Brother, where are your gods? I said, what gods? He said, you're fruit from New York. I said, I guess they're over at the amphitheater. He says, uh, man, well, you better get him around you. I said, for what? He said, man, these people are going crazy. I didn't know what he meant. He drove me to the amphitheater and they were expecting me to come in the front door. I came in the back door. And when I came in, they stopped me. The FOI stopped me at the door. Wouldn't let me in until Rasul permitted them. And when I got up to speak, they had Jeremiah come behind me. Go look at the movie. While he behind others stood up in case I said anything out of the way, they would have snatched me down. But listen, brother, Jeremiah have confessed to me. I know what went on now.
I wasn't going to go out there and make no doggone spectacle of myself and you. If I didn't think I knew what the next step was, and Wallace said he knew and was going to be true to his father, go ahead, man. I'll submit and follow you. Just like you said today, brother. If somebody can prove you wrong, you sit down and follow. That's a humble heart. And I felt the same way. And when he began to speak, he praised Master Farrakh Muhammad. You remember that same today? He said he was going to honor the seat of his father. He said his father was not flesh and blood from the clay of Georgia. His father was a mind and a spirit and an intelligence. Didn't he say it? I said, well, he's all right. Maybe we can walk together. I went back to New York and apologized to all of the people for what I had said about Wallace and said, let's lock together because the messenger wouldn't want us breaking up into division. I didn't know who Wallace was or what he was to do. Six months, in fact, it was 30 days later, I'm right out here in California, in Los Angeles, at the home of the woman called Mary of the Supremes. Her husband tells me, look, Muhammad Ali's lawyer was in town and told me that they're going to get rid of you because you've been stealing the money and they're going to move you out of New York and they're going to bring Jeremiah in from Philly. This is a lost found telling me what's going to happen to me in a nation that I work night and day with my Lord to build. Now I'm telling you, I was not afraid. But what I was afraid of is trying to lead you and lead you wrong. That's what I was afraid of. Not no combination of niggas. Damn it, when you know Allah and know the messenger, you're not afraid of people. I went on with what? I went down in the Caribbean. People coming up by the thousands. Rasul come down and tear me up. Him and Akbar, all of them, followed my tracks. Five months later, they undermined me in New York. Moved me out. I knew it was coming. Went right along with it. Went to Chicago. Wallace Muhammad said, you speak once a month. Once a month. Gave me $400 a week. I ain't never made that much under the message. He raised my pay $100 and then stopped me from preaching. Figuring that he'd just keep me flying around till I run out of gas. That's right. Then took my assistant minister, Mr. Larry Foyer, Kareem Abdel Aziz, brought him up from St. Louis, sitting beside me one day and laughed in my face and said to me, meet your new boss. I never said a word. I went out with Brother Aziz for dinner that night. I said, Brother Aziz, just like you served me in New York, I'll serve you in Chicago. God had brought me down, brother, so he could purify me for today. When Wallace started talking about his father, you don't know this, Brother Muhammad. You don't know this, Sister Muhammad. None of you know it. But I went to Wallace. I said, Brother, in fact, when I went in his office, he had the tape recorder going. All these guards standing around. I can't talk to the leader of the nation and cut him down in the presence of his guards. I want to talk to him alone, man to man. And I've been talking to him like that, Brother, long before I ever knew there was a Silas Muhammad in the world. I talk to that man face to face, tooth to tooth. I ain't afraid of a damn soul, brother, but Allah and his messenger. I want you all to know that. I said to him, I said, brother, I said, Malcolm made that mistake. I said, you got a short track record. You just got started. I said, if you attack your father, whom everybody's faith is in, 
I said, and make the people think that he is immoral, the people will go back into the world. I said, leave your father alone and go on and do what you have to do. I'm telling you what I told him. I told him this in the Watergate in December of 1975. I told him again on a tape in either March or April of 1976. I told him, look, I didn't come here to sit around and die. I said, the messenger put too much in me. If you don't want me, I'll leave you just like you left him. But you don't know what I told him, because I wasn't going out on the mountain. I was talking to him, honoring my word. But it was killing me. I tried to preach what he preached, because I couldn't answer the question. A new teaching was coming, maybe this is it. Or maybe this is what the messenger was leading us into. The truth uh, or the practice of the Quran, like this practice over there. I'm trying to read the thing out. Every day I'm slipping further the town, losing the spirit till I got so, I, I just didn't know what. You mean to tell me 20 years I've been preaching, I've been preaching live? So I just shut my mouth. And in January, of 1977, Wallace Muhammad called me. I had been silent for four months. He said, brother, the spirit is dying in the nation. And frankly, we are hurting because you are not speaking. As God is my witness. He said, brother, I would like for you to go back to New York. Or you can have Chicago or Los Angeles or Cleveland or Detroit. I said, well, I said, I can't go back to New York unless somebody go in and clean up all the garbage that's been thrown on my name in New York. You know what he told me? He said, those that threw that on you in New York, they're not in the temple anymore. I said, but they live in the city. Now, what am I saying this to you for, brothers and sisters? I'm saying this to you because I was talking to him challenging what he was saying to the messenger before August 1977. That had been going on quietly and privately since 1975, December. I'm trying to harmonize his teaching until I got so stretched out, I found out I couldn't preach for the father and the son at the same time. I had to make a decision between that father and that son. And I still didn't know who he was. Traveled all over this world. I began to hate religion. And finally, a brother right here in this room tonight, Bernard Cushman, called me on a telephone and said, brother, where is Wallace in prophecy? He said, I don't know. I ain't read the Bible in a long time, now. I screw with it, brother. I'm just telling you the truth. He said, you don't know where he is? I said, no, I don't. I preached the messenger in the temple right in Wallace's face. I told them in there, I said, you got a nerve not wanting to speak his name. And he built this house. He gave you everything you got, including the email. That was my last sermon that I preached in temple number two. That was right in his face. All right, brother. I don't need no medal. I should have done it a long time ago. But there was a weakness in me. There was a little germ of hypocrisy in me that God had to manifest and bring out. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I'm facing the germ in me. <laughs> How many of you are facing the germ in you? Now, once I understood Wallace and prophecy, I jumped straight up. That was September 1977. When I jumped up in September, Brother Muhammad had been up and went to Chicago. And that's when I heard 
When I met him in December, he showed me the letter that he presented to Wallace D. Muhammad. And here we are tonight. As I told him to his face with tears in my eyes, I thank Allah for the clean work he was producing. And I mean that from the depth of my heart. But I'm not going to be no hypocrite. I can't say, Brother Muhammad, I agree with you totally. I can only tell him what I agree with and what I disagree with. And I think that time will heal the wound. So I say this, brothers and sisters, I'm going to go on and lift up the name of the messenger. And I'm going to teach his teachings as he gave them to me to teach. I'm going to try not to add to nor take away from I'm not out here, Brother Muhammad, trying to hustle people to get no money. I want you to know that, because I got better ways of getting money than tampering with people's minds and hearts. I know I'd be playing with my life, and I love my life too much to play with it. Now answer me this as I leave you. When I stood up for the messenger again, I had been prodigal, that's true. But when I stood up, there were followers of Elijah Muhammad that hated me because I didn't stand up in 1975. There are followers of Wallace that hated me because they say I deserted Wallace. What you don't know, the Arabs have already come and offered me millions of dollars if I would not preach Wallace nor Elijah, but preach Prophet Muhammad. They offered me, I'm telling you what the Rabbata at Mecca, and I'll call the man's name Dr. Ahmed Saka, who's over all of the Rabbata in the Western Hemisphere offered me Wallace's place and offered to call me the Mujahideen. And he said, when you're dead, we may even refer to you as the Messiah. I said, look at this man. He must think I'm some famed person that's trying to seek some self-position. He must think I would sell out the messenger for his million dollars. Where could I go on the earth and enjoy it? So I'm not in this for no dollars. I want you to know that. And all of these brothers that say they with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, ask them what I asked Russia Dean, what I asked everyone that stood up and said, okay, Brother Farrakhan, we ready to help the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I said, the first thing I asked them, are you ready to live the restrictive law of Islam? I said, I'm gonna live that law to the best of my ability. Because we can't play today with righteousness. Righteousness is our only salvation today. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, he said, brother, you can talk like me. Brother, you can be bold like I am if you want to. He said, but if you're not 100% to the law, the devil will piece you in two. And that's why Brother Muhammad is preaching righteousness. Because he knows that righteousness is the only protection for all of us. I say publicly in the face of you and others that I love you, brother. And I honor you for your stand. And I thank Allah for you, brother, and for these that you are producing. I will never oppose you in the good that you're trying to do. I will never go out and use my tongue against you because Allah is sufficient as a judge over those who say they believe in him and the Holy Quran teaches you and me that Allah will settle our differences and I'm putting the difference in the hand if this is his prophet Allah is going to let us know it I hope before too long so that if he is, then we won't be the losers. 
And if he's not Allah's prophet, Allah's going to show that to him because he's sincere and he means good and he is good, otherwise he couldn't produce good. And that's why I love him and that's why I came here tonight because I said something better than what anybody hoped for is going to come out of this. We are not going to agree. But at the same time, we are going to agree that we as followers of the Hanbi Elijah Muhammad ain't going to strike each other. Not while the hypocrites are raging and the devils are planning. We can't let them come between none of us. So you that are with Brother Muhammad, go on with him. If you believe, stand with him, press him, work with him. But I, all I would say is, I'll be watching. And you watch me. Because if God's hand is on me, he'll make it manifest, not in this little house, but he's going to make it manifest in the world. I'm not going to fight you, Brother Muhammad. I will not do that. You have proved to me before and now that you love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I am not going to fight you. I may disagree, but I'm not going to fight you. And I'm not going to give no hypocrite in here the pleasure of having us tearing at each other. No, no. I said what I had to say. And I heard what you had to say. And I witnessed with you on the truth of what I believed in what you said. And I trust in Allah to judge us both. But I'm going to go on and lift up the messenger's name. And I know you will do the same. And if anybody molests you, brother, in the lifting up of the messenger's name, I know that as Allah protected his messenger, he'll protect you. As the messenger told me, and there was nobody there to hear it but me, but Allah is a witness. He said, brother, the same power that is with me will be with you. In fact about it, brother, he said, there'll be two of us backing you up, Allah and myself. Now I'm going forward, and I'm not asking nobody to walk behind me. I'm going to lift up the words and teaching of Elijah Muhammad until Allah gets finished with Brother Farrakhan. And I thank you for allowing me to share this night with you. And I uh, thank you, Brother Bay, for inviting me. And I thank you, Brother Muhammad, for listening to me. And I preach you, all of you, in peace. And I say to those who follow Messenger Muhammad and to those who follow Brother Silas Muhammad, when you meet each other on the street, don't let the devil see us not like brothers. Let's greet each other. If we're not in agreement, you know, we say peace and keep moving because Allah will bring us together in His time, in His way. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.